On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Relativity Space scrubs their Terran 1 launch for the second time, a Japanese astronomer catches an asteroid impact on the moon, and NASA's Cape Kennedy becomes a bustling spaceport. This is the Space Race. Relativity Space was forced to scrub their Terran 1 for a second time on March 11th, as the 3D printed rocket suffered some internal difficulties that forced the ground team to call more than one hold, and finally a full halt to launch activity at 45 seconds after 4pm EST. The innovative rocket is over 85% 3D printed, including the 9 Eon 1 engines, and represents a huge leap forward for the rocket industry's ability to quickly and cheaply produce vehicles. And as we know, anything innovative is going to run into some engineering problems during testing. Its first attempt at launch on March 8th was scrubbed due to the rocket's second stage being unable to hold its liquid oxygen fuel at the right temperatures. The team took three days to fix the issue and then set up for a Saturday launch window. Everything was operating properly this time, aside from a quick hold to deal with a boat that had wandered into range. As the launch clock hit zero, the engines roared to life in a spectacular display that lasted about one second before they immediately flamed out and went dark. The engines were shut off in response to telemetry showing that there was something wrong inside the rocket. The rocket was kept fueled so it didn't seem to be a very big issue, and sure enough the clock restarted soon afterwards, targeting a 4pm EST launch, but 45 seconds before we hit zero, a final hold and scrub was called. The problem? The second stage had another failure, this time the internal pressure was just 1 psi too low. Now, any fan of rocketry knows that first launch attempts are rarely successful. The Relativity broadcast raised this point as well, along with a great point about why rockets tend to fail on their first runs. First launches are not just tests, they are part of the development process. A lot of components that go into a vehicle can be tested on the ground. Look at SpaceX, they are putting their empty vehicle on the can crusher to test pressure on the structure. They are test firing engines and then static firing whole assemblies. They are doing cryoproofing tests to see the effects of thermal shock and fuel pressures on the internals. They are trying different methods of construction, stacking their vehicles to test connections, and going through a checklist of potential issues that might befall their launch hardware like the orbital launch mount. But most of the very important parts of testing can't be done in a safe testing environment. You can't really test staging the way a rocket separates in flight without the vehicle actually being in flight. You can't see how the connections hold up in wind shear, you can't see how the fuel pressure holds up in low gravity, and definitely can't test landings without launching the rocket. So once all that ground testing is done, the only thing a company can do is try for a flight and get as much information as possible out of the attempt. This isn't a secret either. We've seen every rocket company and administration go through this process. SpaceX lost a couple Falcon 9s while learning how to land them. The SLS had a very public struggle with their hydrogen fuel system and its many leaks, something they couldn't have found out without stacking that monster and putting it on the pad. The Japanese space agency JAXA lost their new H3 rocket on March 7th as its upper stage engines failed to light and after dealing with some engine issues the day before. And we can't forget Astra, who rushed through their Rocket 3 test launches and ended up losing two important NASA payloads to a cooling issue they never detected. So when people like Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut Michael Sheets and Eric Berger, come on the Relativity stream and talk about how they're very confident that the Terran 1 won't make it to orbit on its first attempt, it's because historically, even well-tested rockets sometimes fail. So expecting vehicles that are in development to perform flawlessly is not only a bit foolish, but it also wouldn't teach the engineering teams anything. This is why the goals are different for test launches. It would be great if the rocket got to orbit, sure, but the ground team is looking for data. So they only really hope for liftoff, then maybe they hope for the vehicle to safely pass max Q, the point at which atmospheric and acceleration pressures on the vehicle are the highest, then they can hope for a good second stage separation, and so on. 
because each of those major failure points tell the team something, and if the rocket does fail, they want it to fail while there's nothing expensive attached to the upper stage, typically. Again, Astra really should have spent more time on their rocket considering how often it failed in testing. But the point is rockets fail. They are some of the most complicated hardware humanity can make, using cutting edge science to push the limits of what we can do. We want them to fail, to lift off, to leak, to lose battery power, to fail a separation, because we learn more from failure than we do success. And those of us watching this happen should be cheering these attempts because they further our knowledge. Relativity failed to launch on Saturday, but they have a solid rocket built with technology that could change the way we manufacture more than just rockets. And just like with the H3, Rocket 3, the SLS, and Starship, what Relativity learns with Terran 1 will help us all. On February 23rd, the cameras of a Japanese astronomer trained on the moon caught something startling, an explosion from a meteor impact large enough to be seen from Earth and likely created a crater over a dozen meters in diameter. Daichi Fujii, the curator of the Hiratsuku City Museum, was lucky enough to catch the explosion with some cameras he had set up. The moon doesn't have our thick atmosphere, so meteors aren't burned up or slowed down before smashing into the surface. But even with our atmosphere's protection, an object that could create an explosion that large passing that close to us is a little unnerving. The subject of asteroid defense is getting more attention lately, with the whole world looking forward to the next phase of our development in space, but also because we've never been more able to protect ourselves from impacts than we are right now. Plans have been made for decades, of course, but in October 2022, the DART mission slammed a vending machine-sized impactor probe into the Astro Dimorphos and proved that we could redirect an incoming object if we detect it soon enough. Right now, agencies around the world scan image data for signs of large asteroids. We're not overly worried about smaller objects, we get hit with those all the time with very little effect, but for the monsters that are over 140 meters in length, planetary defense organizations put in big effort for little funding and we're just not finding them all. Planetary scientist Dr. Phil Metzger recently tweeted out some informational slides from a presentation reportedly held by Lindley Johnson, manager of NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. In it, Dr. Metzger notes that the PDCO has an established plan for finding, cataloging, and dealing with these threats, but the problem isn't coming up with a plan. DART proved we can handle that. The problem is spotting a threat before it's too close to deal with. This graphic from Lindley Johnson's presentation shows that we are frighteningly behind on finding these objects. We can figure out how many of these big asteroids should be out there using mathematical models, which is how we get the numbers we aim to find. But the difficulty we have finding asteroids at all is stopping us from getting a really accurate count. Aside from the fact that it's very difficult to find these relatively small, fast-moving objects against a black sky is only part of the problem. The biggest drawbacks are lack of funding for these programs and oversaturation of new satellites and debris in orbit. Back in August 2022, a survey of planetary defense experts was published about the danger posed by constellation satellites like SpaceX's Starlink network, and they are at least somewhat concerned. If you are calculating that you are not finding over 50% of these dangerous near-Earth asteroids and have to filter out which moving light streaks are potential impactors or just the latest Starlink deployment, you can see why these organizations are worried. And we're finding potentially dangerous asteroids all the time. Just last week, astronomers caught a near-Earth rock about the size of an Olympic swimming pool which could hit us in 2046. This object, designated 2023-DW, has a 1 in 600 chance of crossing our path directly, but in space, that's a relatively close call, and a 50-meter rock might not destroy a state, but it could certainly do some damage. This is why it's so important that asteroid defense groups are getting some attention. We have proven that we can do something about asteroids like 2023-DW and much larger, but we need to get the funding to help find them in the first place, because it's not if we get hit, it's when. 
with the space race heating up this year, it looks like NASA and the U.S. Space Force will be leasing three legacy space launch complexes at the Cape Canaveral spaceport to four new contenders for launch schedules on the Florida coast. All of the new companies are looking to break into the small sat launch markets with cheap, smaller rockets intended on making regular trips into low Earth orbit for commercial and state contracts. SLC-13 looks to be the busiest. This was the complex that housed the Atlas rockets from 1958 to 1978, and the Space Force will be leasing it out to newcomers Phantom Space and Via Space. Phantom is looking to launch their secretive Daytona vehicle for the first time this year and managed to land a shared lease with Via, a company founded by former NASA astronaut Sid Gutierrez. Via has a goal to be the greenest rocket company in the market and looks to test out a new hybrid engine as well as their Dauntless rocket this year. For those of you wondering why SLC-13 sounds like a familiar location, that's because it's also being partially leased by SpaceX for landing their Falcon 9 boosters on pads 1 and 2. There's likely going to be some shuffling once Phantom and Via begin building on the site, but for now, there's been no word on if SpaceX is going to move on to another vacant pad for their landings or not. SLC-14 was the complex that launched the Mercury Atlas missions, and it's being handed over to Stoke Space. Stoke is following in SpaceX's shoes and wanting to one-up them by attempting a completely reusable vehicle. Their second stage features a unique engine design with a heat shield that is actively regeneratively cooled by flowing the cryogenic fuel through the walls of the shield and using the heat of re-entry to power the pumps needed to do that. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, had a great interview with this team in early February, and they look very promising. Finally, a company called ABL will be leasing the partially demolished SLC-15 site, where the Titan 1 and 2 launches took place from 1959 to 1964. ABL is the only one of these companies that has already flown a rocket, with their RS-1 vehicle having had an attempt in Alaska back in January of this year. The RS-1 is built to take off of very simple pads, so it's likely they won't have to put in much work to make the old SLC-15 launch area useful. It's good to see a lot of these older sites getting opened up again. SLC-15, for instance, hasn't had any use since it closed in the mid-60s. But with the space race heating up, there are so many companies chomping at the bit for a place to operate. We'll have to see how crowded the launch schedule gets on the Cape. SpaceX alone is looking to reach 100 launches of their Falcon 9 this year and also get their Starship Super Heavy vehicle up and running. But... I'm sure these smaller companies can find some time to squeeze their contracts in there. SpaceX has to rest at some point. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.